Good afternoon, everyone. I am Val Oniski with the Local Search Association, and I would like to welcome you to LSA's webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Local Presence Management, Location, Consistency, and Customers, and will be brought to you by our guest presenter, Will Scott from Search Influence. Before we begin, we just have one housekeeping issue. Feel free to type any question you may have in the question box on the screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, Will will be happy to answer questions. With that, we are ready to begin. Over to you, Will. Thank you, Val. And, um, you know, I want to say thanks to the LSA for, for uh, having me on to do this. Uh, Search Influence only just became a member of the LSA, but I've been coming to LSA shows and involved in the organization for the better part of the last decade. Of course, when I first started coming, it was actually the Yellow Pages Association uh, and went through a couple of different iterations. So I'm really glad to be here. So I'm Will Scott. Uh, I'm the CEO of Search Influence. Uh, Search Influence is, a, is an online marketing company based in New Orleans. We work with direct customers. And we work with publishers to help them build uh, to build programs for their advertisers. And what we what we try to assure is that we hit the target when we're when we're working both for our direct customers and our publishers in getting their folks found uh, in whichever medium they may be. So about us, uh, that's our team there. Um, and yes, that's how we look every day because we're in New Orleans and we don't have to wear long pants. So there are about 45 of us in the office and another 60 who help out. Uh, I have been doing this kind of thing for much longer than my youthful appearance uh, would seem to indicate. We are, um, you know, we are active in the community and we try to do our best to share the knowledge. And, and so you can see that uh, folks are happy to have us uh, occasionally talk about what we do. Um, about me, uh, I've been doing this. I've been working online since 1994, uh, which was the first time somebody was silly enough to let me build them a website. Uh, and since then, I've taken it um, to a much higher level. We, uh, we, in the early part of this century, uh, I love saying that, by the way, in the early part of this century, we actually put yellow pages online. We took PDF files and transformed them into um, look and feel online yellow pages, which, it, you know, even as we were doing it, uh, and this being, you know, 2002, people were telling us, you've got to be kidding me, that's, that's like, you know, that's like resurrecting the dodo. But, and, you know, even today, there are still look and feel online yellow pages. And we, we learned in that process that, um, you know, you can, you can sell anything once, uh, but if you want to renew it, you've got to continue to deliver value. So shortly after we figured out how to put the books online, we then had to figure out how do we make sure that people are seeing them. So from books online to books on Google, uh, we learned along the way that the most important thing was how do you make that data accessible to search? And how do you assure that when people click through, they're finding the things that they need so that they can, um, so that they can do business uh, with your customers. Sorry, I lost control there for a moment. Okay, there we go. So I'm going to share with you guys some data, which uh, was recently published um, by Street Fight Magazine uh, in, a, in a, a white paper that they did with uh, YP.com. A lot of this is very interesting when you're thinking about local and why it's so important. So the most important thing is to deliver value to users, right? And at the point that value to users intersects with local search content, that's where, that's where transactions have an opportunity to happen. 
One of the things that's interesting, and I think we knew this intuitively, but it's being supported by data over and over, is that as the number of devices increase, the number of searches increase. So as you can see down there on the bottom line, somebody who has all three, a PC, a smartphone, and a tablet, is going to be doing almost twice as many searches as somebody who just has a PC and a smartphone, and four times as many as somebody who just has a PC. When they're searching for businesses, what are they looking for? And it's interesting, right, going back to uh, the origins of the LSA, uh, the Yellow Pages Association, you know, they're looking for maps, they're looking for hours of operations, they're looking for addresses. So what does this mean? This means that even in a world where our searches are happening on digital devices, it's still about making doors swing. They're still looking to walk through the door of a local merchant to do business. Where is this happening? In the main, it's happening on search engines. So as you can see across a number of categories, and I truncated this because I, I, I wanted the numbers big, um, the, you can see that they're doing a lot of those searches on search engines and not necessarily on local search sites. Um, this, this study was sponsored by YP.com and, and, and certainly they would rather that it was the other way around, but, but as of today, uh, it's happening on the search engines, and since Google represents more than 70% of search on any given day, it's probably happening on Google. This slide is interesting because you can start to see that you can start to see that tablets and smartphones are becoming the device of choice for search almost more than PC. It's coming. Uh, I've seen data from um, the Kelsey group that suggests that 2015 will be the year in which mobile eclipses the PC. Uh, in conversations I've had with Greg Sterling, you know, his, his indication is that he thinks it's happened already, but that a lot of that is opaque to us because it's happening uh, within apps. So local is relative, you know, and we've been saying this a long time. There's a, you know, you're going to drive a much shorter distance for a dry cleaner then you're going to drive for a uh, then you're going to drive for a you know a good surgeon right so what local means is is relative and the good news is that that Google knows this and they show us the the relative locality to the type of business uh, I'd, I'd love to know how they figured that out and and obviously sometimes they get it wrong but in the main um, they do a pretty good job of giving us the more relevant local. So why is this so important? There is a ton of search happening that is local, and local search equals purchase. So according to, you know, according to, to TMP, 61% of local searches result in a purchase. We've seen other data that suggests that the number of searches that are happening on a smartphone or, or other mobile device that lead to um, that lead to a transaction or even higher that that as many as 90 percent of smartphone searches lead to an action of some kind whether that's a you know whether that's a, a form filled out or a phone call in the context of lead generation or uh, whether that's a purchase being made in the context of of an actual transactional or e-commerce website. So I'm sure you've all seen something like this, right? Uh, paid results up at the top, map results directly beneath, and organic results uh, under the map. And and what's you know what's really interesting over the last couple of years is that Google is making it much harder for us to get to the traditional organic results, and. When we first started Search Influence uh, six, almost seven years ago, local search meant ranking organically for locally relevant searches. And, and when I left YP Solutions and we were trying to make Yellow Pages rank, well, that's what we were doing, because we were trying to make the Sprint Yellow Pages and names and numbers rank well locally when somebody typed in you know, Las Vegas limo service. And there was no map. So it was really about what can you do to rank organically. So as you can see, when there's a local search present, uh, Google is, is dominating the top of the page with 
with information over which they have primary control. So what's the most important thing? The most important thing is uh, what we refer to as the NAP, um, which is the name, address, and phone number. This is actually a phrase coined by uh, Gib Olander, formerly of Localese. And it leads to some really great imagery, as you see there. So what's, what's the NAP consist of? It's name, address, and phone number. And, and Mike Blumenthal uh, added to it the plus W. So when the local search sites, uh, Google and, and the others, are trying to determine the relevance of your listing to the thing that was searched for, when it is a search for which they would draw a map, NAP is what drives the decision of who gets seen. Now, there are localization factors that are coming in where Google can start to infer where you are, but still, what it comes down to is NAP. So even if what, they, what you typed in was plumber versus plumber Encinitas, California, if you happen to be in Encinitas, California, it's going to be just the same thing. And the extent to which your NAP matches what Google thinks it should be is going gonna, is gonna to help them understand what you're about. So why is it so essential? Because you don't want to confuse Google. It's, it's sort of my new mantra, is don't confuse Google. If you send Google the signals that, that, they, that they perceive to be the important ones about the topic at hand, you're going to rank well. People are going to click. They're going to call you. They're going to buy your products. They're going to make you rich beyond measure. I haven't checked in on last night's Powerball, so I don't know if I'm already rich beyond measure. So your app should be present on your website. It should be present in your social media. It should be present in business directories. So you know, interestingly, though for SEO purposes, uh, people have been saying that directories are dead. For local SEO purposes, directories are alive and well. Except their business directories, and we call them citations. So what are some examples of that? YP.com is a great example. Uh, Super Pages, Yellow Book, Yelp, all of these can be part of that citation set, which is going to lend authority to your NAP. You can think of your NAP as a local search fingerprint, but the, the, the way that Google knows that it's really you. So beyond the NAP, what do you need? You need content. People are looking for maps, websites, photos, promotions. Uh, and this tracks with some of the data that we've seen relative to, relative to social as well. You know, what are people looking for in social? They're looking for the things that demonstrate that you're a real company that does real company stuff, which includes offering specials, showing pictures of your team and your location, and in general, just being a member of your community. So what's a good starting point? To audit your NAP. By auditing the NAP of your business or the locations that you're representing, if you, you are a multi-location business or in the directory business, you can, you can determine by the extent to which your NAP matches what you would think was authoritative, you, you can determine your local search strengths. You can find the weaknesses that might be confusing Google and having a negative impact on your rankings. You can, you can discover optimization opportunities. And you can prevent duplication and data corruption. Uh, one of the challenges that we see is that a lot of times, what we believe to be the authoritative NAP gets confused. And no matter how much we may do to claim it and clean it up in the locations that we can find, all of those online directories from which we get those great citations, there's, there's data out there that doesn't support what we believe to be the authoritative NAP. And so where's this data coming from? Sometimes it's coming from the primary data sources, you know, from the from the 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 axioms and localizes of the world, and we'll talk about them a little bit more uh, later when we talk about cleanup. But 
a lot of times they'll come from second and third tier directories that may have gotten a data feed from one of these guys a long time ago. So what I often you know, remind people of is that the way that the data got into uh, Locally's Axiom Info USA's databases was back in the 80s and 90s, we shipped a whole bunch of phone books overseas and somebody keyed them into a database. So from that source point, you can understand how the data that gets out into the ecosystem may not be all that we would want it to be. So when auditing your NAP, you want to make sure, as I'm sure you guessed, that your name, address, and phone number are correct. Uh, what we found is that using the Secretary of State website, we can find a really authoritative business name, and we can get a good idea about the address. And once we've got a good idea about the address, at least in the U.S., we can go to the U.S. Postal Service and use their ZIP4 database to find out what do they think is the authoritative address. And then, and this is where a lot of people get tripped up, uh, especially multi-location businesses that have a call center. One phone number per location is the least confusing way for you to present information to the search engines. And if you can do that, then, then you can have a consistent map across the board. Now, we've seen instances uh, where, and, and we've done this in testing, and we've seen it coming from some national marketing companies, where they will push call tracking phone numbers out into the, out into the, the local search ecosystem so that they can demonstrate that they're delivering leads to their customers. And from their business perspective, I totally understand that. They need to show the value if they want that customer or that, or that brand to renew for the ad program that they've purchased. But this is really, really dangerous from a local search perspective. Because what happens if I'm a plumber in Chicago, let's say, and I sign up with a national marketing company who builds me a website, gives me a phone number, which is their phone number, they own it, and it then gets seeded out through the ecosystem. If that is the P of my NAP, even though my name and address are not going to change, if ever I decide that I want to take my business elsewhere, I don't own that phone number. And therefore, a really critical component of, of my business identity is no longer available to me. So I, I just want to make it clear that, that as great as call tracking numbers are for us as marketers, and uh, you know, I remember when they were called RCF numbers, uh, when they were still associated with a hard line down at the switching station, they're not always the best opportunity for the advertisers that we're hoping to serve. And so we tend to avoid them except in cases where we can be really confident that, that they're not going to get scraped. Because the data companies have gotten a lot smarter, right? You no longer need to send books offshore to get keyed. Now you can simply scrape websites that are out there on the Internet and get the same information. And if it's bad information, it filters out for the ecosystem and, and can be there for a long time and require a lot of cleanup. I know we all want success with Google Plus Local, right? And great news is we finally figured out how Google wants us to pronounce it. I have this on on the uh, you know on 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 good good opinion from one of the Googlers themselves. It is Google Plus Local. So in order to get ready for Google Plus Local, it's important to have one listing per location. Now, firms with multiple practitioners can have a um, they can have a practitioner listing and a practice listing. So let's use the example of uh, a firm here locally in New Orleans, Maple Street Chiropractic. Maple Street Chiropractic is the brand. They would be entitled to a listing. The two doctors there are, are Dr. Nick Thompson and Dr. Gordon Dubois, and each of them would be entitled to their own listing. One wants to be careful with this because in very large, um, in very large organizations and even in large buildings that may house multiple locations, these things can get confused and require a lot of cleanup. You want to have complete data. Oh, and by the way, on the one listing per location 
multiple practitioner thing. Uh, Google, in the last several weeks, literally, I mean, within may have been two weeks ago, gave us new advice on how to do this. It's a really nice way of saying they changed the rules and screwed us all. But it used to be that you, if you had a solo practice and the doctor's name was not the practice name, as in the case of Maple Street Chiropractic, then it would be reasonable for the practice to have one listing and the doctor to have another. We have it from the forums within the last couple of weeks that this is no longer the way they want it. And, and I'm not sure if this blog post has gone live, but we're, uh, we're writing this up right now so that we can share it with the rest of the community. It's a big change because we have been claiming both, and, and now we have only one. Um, get your data together. You want your, you want your website address, you want your categories and photos, and, and uh, Mike Blumenthal has a great tool that outlines a significant number of categories for, for Google Places. Um, if you do find duplicates, you can use the report a problem on on the Google Maps, uh, or you can escalate it to a Google troubleshooter. They actually have people, real life people, who are experts in areas where the maps appear that will go out and check on stuff. Uh, we we had this happen for one of our clients in Mexico, who had multiple hotel locations, and and the criterion on which they were basing whether or not it was a distinct location was did it have a reservation office in the building? And so, you know, this guy went cruising around Playa del Carmen, Mexico, uh, confirming that. One great way, and we have some of our customers, one of our newspaper customers, get listed is a big piece of how they start their process. They use it as a selling tool. So let's say that you were calling on this business, Search Influence, at 8120 Oak Street in New Orleans. If you could walk in there and you've got a great local search product to sell me, and you could say, hey, Will, um, I put your information in to get listed, and they're saying you're only 67% complete. If you use our product, we can get you up to 100%. So it's a great first screen if you want to be able to advise a prospective customer of, of some opportunity for them to, to improve their standing. Yes, I know. This is like the cobbler's children going to school with holes in their shoes, but, you know, what can I say? I'm busy giving webinars. You can go deeper on this. And, and when we start working particularly uh, on, on multi-location clients, we do. There's a, there's, a few, um, there's a few power tools out there. A couple of them are, there's one from a company called Whitespark up in Canada. Uh, there's Bright Local, which has some, some nice analysis tools. Um, and I know that there are some other vendors who are coming into the market with uh, generalized sales estimation tools to include a lot of this stuff. But if you want to dig deep on, on citations and how you build them out, um, I recommend uh, Whitespark and Bright Local. And, and the next step, of course, is having determined what's out there, organizing it and trying to think about it in a, you know, in a clear and consistent way. Um, if you want to go the cheap route, you can just go to Google and you can type in the business name in quotes plus the phone number in quotes. And it'll show you all of the iterations of the name, address, and phone number. We spend a lot of time in spreadsheets, as you can imagine, because we've got thousands of citations that we've got to manage on a daily basis, and the and and it is a it is a it is a process. Um, we're looking for the perfect tool. Uh, maybe we'll maybe we'll just have to break down and build it one day. So this is what it looks like when um, you know when you have inconsistencies, right? Uh, this is an older view of the map, but you know here's here's some law firm in Portland, and as you can see, you know they've got their own, own URL. They've got a uh, this is the old tags that Google is using. Um, they've got maps.google.com present, so it's possible to have a lot of bad information out there, and and. It's just got to get cleaned up in order for, for Google and the other engines to understand what you're all about. So how do you fix those inconsistencies? The, the first step is to check the core data sources, info group, local leads, and axiom, incorrect citation information. Once you've done that, you're going you're gonna to cover the top level. You know, and, that's, and that's really important because 
those are going to feed out to the rest of the sites that you're ultimately going to want to, um, to fix. There, there's a misconception, particularly at the SMB level, if they've heard from UBL or Locales, they, they have come to believe, based on really good um, selling, that to insert their data is the magic bullet. And then, of course, one has to help them understand that just because it's right at UBL and Locales doesn't mean that it's right in all of the places that they distribute data to. So we often have to help um, our clients understand that there is a need for cleanup even after taking that first step of, of, clean, of, of putting good data into the initial data sources. When working with a ton of SMBs as we do, it's critical to keep track of login information. The, we've learned that you can't recover passwords from some places, and ultimately you just have to start from scratch and then try to kill the bad listing if you don't keep that stuff. You want to use one email account per brand so that you can have a, a good container for any notifications that may come in. You want, to, you want to be sure that your name, address, and phone number isn't already listed before you add citations to the data sources. Each of them, Axiom, Info Group, and, and Locales, have the ability to have an update versus an insertion. And if, if the listing is there and you can update it, then you have a higher likelihood of having it trickle down from there. You want to monitor your citations. I, you know, I say periodically here, but for us it's more like constantly. And, and having done that, you want to get rid of any duplication that you see out there. It's not just in the data either, right? The, a lot of local optimization is influenceable by what's happening on your website. You'd be surprised how many websites, you know, here in 2012, almost 2013, don't have a name, address, and phone number in the footer of their homepage. Don't have a phone number big and clear where you can read it or click on it if you're on a mobile device. And, and you wouldn't be surprised, but very, very few websites have the information about their name, address, and phone number structured in a way that it is absolutely clear what it is that you're trying to say uh, when Google comes crawling. So the great news is that the search engines, having recognized that these were problems, got together on a couple of different formats. Um, the first one was called HCARD, and it was, uh, it's, it, it's held at, at microformats.org, and it was the original way. If you've ever had a V card sent to you by email, you've seen HCARD data. The new, the new version of this is schema.org. Um, the schema is, is the, the up and comer and, and will ultimately replace HCARD. Just anecdotally, we have found that we like to have them both, uh, sort of a belt and suspenders approach. And then you can validate those with the Google Rich Snippet Tester. The Google Rich Snippet Tester is really cool because it has a whole bunch of different formats loaded in there and can tell you whether or not you've done it right. It's important to the extent that you can, and this is not always possible, to have just one H card or schema designation per page. Um, and that speaks to the importance of local landing pages, which we'll talk about in just a second. This is what it looks like. Uh, I apologize for the blurriness of that. Um, you know, as you can see, it's, it's outlining information uh, in a way that it can be easily read by computers. The organization, the street address, the locality, region, postal code. And then, of course, the telephone number. And, and by putting those things in structured data, you assure that you're not going to confuse Google. So what does it look like in practice? It starts to look like this, where you've got your, you've got your NAP in schema or H card. You've got localized content. You've embedded a map. And this is, you know, this is important because you're, you're creating a round trip of those signals. You know, it's not just Google saying, hey, you're all right. It's you saying to Google, hey, the data you have about us is all right. And then, of course, you know, from a marketing perspective, it's important for us to have good calls to action and then to have an opportunity for customers 
to find us and review us because, of course, reviews are becoming an important currency of online marketing. And the cool thing is that reviews on our website, thanks to schema and thanks to, um, thanks to microformat, can now show up in Google. Right here, you can see this particular, uh, this particular surgical practice up in um, Albany. They have a five-star rating, and it's associated with their website. So showing those stars in the search results is a great opportunity to sort of drive behavior, because the search results page is really a marketing opportunity. And then up above, you can see um, this is an example of, of another kind of structured data called authorship. Google is moving more and more to authorship. In other words, how much do they trust the creator of content versus how much do they trust the content itself? For, for multi-locations, uh, multi-location businesses and, um, and directories, it's, it's really important to use a single landing page for each location. And then in the case of a multi-location business or franchise, uh, it's important to use that local landing page when claiming that Google Plus listing. The, the factors that you'll want to include in, in a local landing page are, are the map, as we saw above, the map, uh, optimized headings so that you can help, help the search engines understand what you're about um, in a broader keyword context, and then all the typical meta descriptions. Um, interestingly, including those testimonials and reviews can really help to get the to get the engines to understand the value of the pages you're delivering. And then finally, and this is just you know good old fashioned search engine optimization, optimizing that URL structure. So if you're promoting a pizza restaurant in Falls Church, Virginia, there's nothing wrong with the URL saying pizza Falls Church, Virginia. It's just one more signal to help reinforce that location. This is a real example of a of a client that we that, that we saw in the wild. Um, on the left is what it looked like before a single change, and that single change was to change the uh, change the location of the web page in their Google listing. And having done that, 15 minutes later, bam, new listing, much better result set. This is a great uh, graphic that was put together by our friends um, at, at Nifty Marketing and Avalanche. Avalanche does great work in uh, social promotion and the creation of, of, of good content for social promotion. And, and you can see it reinforces what we said before. To have the map, to have the, to have the, the good call to action, uh, a way to jump off to reviews. And then if you're building out, uh, if I was building out a new directory today, I would I would go to Google and I would search for an old Yellow Pages phrase, um, the rascal factors, right? Because everything old is new again, and and reliability, areas of service, uh, illustrations, and location are still very important when making a business decision, even if they're the same factors that uh, the Donnelly Company led us to start using a hundred plus years ago. When thinking about deployment for a multi-location business, the same rules apply, but it has to be a much more scalable and automated process. The, the, the challenge and the only good tools that I have seen for consistent map management are, are, not, are not public. You know, they're built by companies like ours to enable them to manage thousands of listings, and, the, and there's not yet one to which you know, you could go subscribe if you're a 20 or 30 location uh, pizza restaurant in Northern Virginia. The, the content pages that you're landing folks on have to be unique. Uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a hope that one can automatically generate landing pages, but it doesn't actually work that way. Typically, you have to have a human involved in the creation of content so that you can, so that you can be sure that, that it is distinct from everything else on the Internet. Uh, and on a technical level, you want to think about the site architecture to assure that the engines can get all the way to those local landing pages. 
because if they stop short at the listings, it's not going to be as it's not going to be as valuable to you from a traffic perspective, or to your advertisers from a lead generation perspective. So, some final thoughts on on uh, you know on what one needs to do to to do this successfully. You want to be thorough and organized. Um, you want to set a schedule to check in because. And, and this is just this is just the biggest challenge that we suffer every day is that in local search we're so reliant on Google and the other search engines and 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 they have not published a playbook for us uh, and oftentimes we'll think that we've got it made and they'll change the rules so it's important to to check in and then you've got to be patient a, a lot of times changes we make will take weeks to percolate through the system and even uh, you know, even in a case where where we're working with a really significant advertiser, somebody who's clearly known to Google, there's nobody who can fix these things. You know, nobody can reach in with a crowbar and make it work. But as with everything online, it's important to stay informed of the issues and and what updates Google is making. And if you're if you're if you're new to this. I definitely recommend allocating budget for expert guidance. There's quite a few people who spend a lot of time studying what's happening in local, and, and they're going to be your best resources when you're trying to figure out a go forward to, to make this work. If, if you're building a directory or you're building a, a directory of your locations, it's important to involve your IT team early because there's a lot of site architecture issues that can really, uh, that can really bite you in the butt going forward trying to build out uh, a, a great local search system. So what does it look like when you do it right? Uh, this is what, we, what we've historically called barnacle SEO, you know, where you uh, attach yourself to every large object you can and wait for the, the searchers to come swimming by. The, when you have, you know, six out of ten slots on page one, um, that's when you've increased just the likelihood that you're going to get found. And then finally, if you're going to you know, if you're going to be in um, Los Angeles next week for for the Kelsey Group's ILM West, uh, we're going to be out there. Uh, my teammate Kelly and I, I'm going to be speaking on the first day in a panel hosted by Andrew Shotland, um, and I'd love to say hi. And that's that's it for me. And I, I, you know, I'm I'm happy to take any questions, and 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 I hope you all enjoyed this. All right, thank you, Will. At this time, we'll be taking questions. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into GoToMeeting now. Um, we've had a couple come in during the presentation, and we'll start off with, can you somehow tell the source of a listing on a Google search engine resort results page? The, um, so the best, the, the best way to do that is what I, uh, is the, the technique that I talked about a few slides back of taking the, the business name and the phone number as it appears in that listing and then entering it into Google uh, with both of those in quotes. It's the best way that we have found to track it back to the source. Um, and unfortunately it is a it is a you know it's it's detective work to to get to the you know to get to the real source many times. All right great next one is do you have any advice for uploading photos in bulk to Google Places slash Google Plus? Sadly, no. Uh, but the good news is that there are a number of sources that Google looks to for photos, um, including including third-party sites, uh, some of the review sites, and of course, Google's own products like Panoramio um, are are sometimes more easy to automate. And if you can force an association with a location and the image through Panoramio, then it is one way that we have seen to influence the photos that show up without necessarily having to use the user interface at Google Places, which, which I would agree is, um, is not a scalable process. Using, using something like Panoramio and pushing them in um, with geodata associated uh, can, can be a scalable process uh, if one is okay writing a little bit of software. 
Do proxy sites affect how Google picks up info? I, I, um, I, I, it's a tough, it's a tough question because, uh, because I'm not exactly sure what the questioner is referring to as, as a proxy site. Um, an example that I can think of is I know that there are some uh, pay-per-click companies who who build a copy of the website and then using what they refer to as a reverse proxy, they will change out the phone number and the um, you know and the contact form for lead generation. Uh, and in those cases, most of those guys are smart enough now. It didn't used to be the case. I remember a few years back we found a whole bunch of them that were associated with one of those companies where they had not used a robot's exclusion to keep them from getting crawled, and so their call tracking numbers were getting uh, crawled associated with the NAP. But but these days, um, most of those most most folks are getting smart enough that they they exclude those pages from search, and therefore the phone number on on what I would think of as a proxy site doesn't get crawled and and can't really cause problems. All right, next question. You mentioned that duplicate citations are bad. Are you talking about from the same site? And then there's a second part. Isn't the goal to get the data to across as many places as possible? I, you know, I can see how I can see how that statement wasn't clear enough. <clears throat> duplicate citations with different information are bad. <clears throat> multiple citations with identical information that matches your authoritative map are awesome. So, so really what I meant to say was duplicate citations with different information, whether on one site or many sites, are, are going to be inherently bad because they're going to have map confusion, which of course is a big problem. All right, we have one more question. What is the what is the speaker's perspective on Manta as a business slash service need source? What was the the, the word right for source? Um, as a it says, what is a, the speaker's perspective on Manta as a business slash service need source? Need source? Yeah, need. I like Manta. Um, I think it's a nice citation. I think that they're doing a lot of good work, uh, both in SEO and in um, getting the word out about online marketing to the SMBs that they're in touch with more than anything else. Uh, I think, though, that it's you know it's really not much different than than a number of other. Similar directory sites um, that have been around over time, uh, you know, Service Magic ultimately took their directory and turned it into a lead gen. Um, there's another one that I'm oh, Merchant Circle, which is another. I mean, these are all, you know, these are all great opportunities for for SMBs to get the word out. And I think that um, I like I like what Manta is doing. I like the folks that I know at Manta. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the the real challenge, of course, is that sometimes in the SMB space, in particular, uh, a merchant will think that they checked the box. They'll think that they'll think that by signing up with a Manta or signing up with a Merchant Circle or a Service Magic, that they got that online marketing thing covered, and that's the only downside of any of those kinds of sites. But but generally speaking, um, you know, I feel I feel good about Manta, and we we typically do use it as a citation source. All right. Well, thank you, Will, for conducting the presentation. Uh, there was a lot of great material here. If there are no additional questions, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact us at LSA, and we will make sure to get put, to get put in touch with today's presenter. Please keep an eye out for future email blasts that promote next month's webinar. Thanks again, and have a great day. Thank you guys for having me. Really enjoyed it. Thank <laughs> you.